You yeah. can get that. There we go. Hey, welcome everybody to the fourth annual Critical Access Hospital Conference. Um, Hillary just said welcome. And so before we get started, wanted to just go over a few housekeeping things. You are muted right now and your camera's automatically turned off. So if you would like to ask any questions, feel free to either send it through in the chat box or in the Q&A feature. So both of those options are out there to, for you. Hillary will be monitoring those for us. So as we see them coming through, she'll ask that. She will um, either interrupt us or we'll ask the questions at the very end. These sessions are being recorded. So that's a fabulous thing. And we will be distributing uh, both the slides and the recordings to all registrants after the webinar is over. And then Keith will remind you of this as he gets to the end of his presentation. But after the entire conference, there will be a short survey for you to complete, to fill out. So just let us know, because we appreciate the time that you are sharing with us today, that you've given us in your day. I know we've got very busy schedules and just appreciate the time that you've given to this. And we want to get your input as to new other topics that you would like to discuss, things that you're interested in, and ways that we can help support you as a firm. So thank you for taking the time to fill that out. Just to give you a background about Stroudwater, we are in the rural healthcare market. Um, we've been in the business actually since 1985, but this map just shows you that since 2017, we have had opportunities to support clients throughout all 50 states. That does include Hawaii and Alaska. And so we're um, very proud of that fact and really appreciate the opportunity we get to help support you in your rural communities in the places where you live every day you're living and working there and we just thank you for the opportunity to support you in that we also have a, a partnership we have a lending usda lending um arm of our organization called Stroudwater Capital Partners. And you can see that they have, um, they're not quite in all 50 states yet, but they have had different um, funding opportunities. We're looking at capital partnerships and capital, not partnerships, but capital investments working to support these different entities in projects that they have going on. So when they're looking at funding for new construction, for build out and things like that, our Stroudwater Capital Partners um, is the firm to help support you with that. And then again, just talking about Stroudwater, the, you know, we're real world mission critical actionable advisory services. So while you may talk to me and we're talking about revenue cycle key indicators today, um, we do have a 37 year track record with rural hospitals, community hospitals, healthcare systems, state offices of rural health, large physician groups, as well as rural health clinics out there. And um, some of the areas that we support are in the strategic advisory areas with planning, mergers, affiliations, and you can see the rest of them listed out, as well as some operational items where revenue cycle seems to, it falls under part of that, as well as your day-to-day -day operations, along with staffing and productivity, cost report reviews, and a lot of other areas. And so when you hear Keith talk today, He's going to be sharing a little bit more on that strategic side and some information that we've pulled that we can help share with you. So with that, I say thank you very much for joining us again. That's our welcome. And we'll get into my favorite topic, revenue cycle, and KPI data that's out there, some essential strategies for rural facilities. So with that, putting on my revenue cycle hat, just to say, what is a KPI and how are they used? We're gonna talk about that. We'll talk about how to develop them uh, within your organization. We have a few examples out there and then some best practices around how to use these KPIs. Now, just the basics, I'm gonna hand this over to Ryan and Ryan, you get to talk about revenue cycle and just where that falls in our claim life cycle and in the whole entire revenue cycle process. Thanks, Amy. Um, <clears throat> so like Amy mentioned, we'll start with very the basics exactly, you know, where what is a KPI and how are they used? You know, when we, we think of KPIs, what we're talking about is, you know, creating some of those quick and easy metrics and tools that can help us in guiding our decision-making. 
Um, the chart that we're showing here, if you go back, Amy, to the, the chart, one slide back, there is a high level overview of the claim life cycle. You know, you see the pre-claim activities on the left and everything kind of in that life cycle in the middle. But, you know, those, those KPIs really kind of fall within that analytics pillar on that far right side. But as we kind of walk through this conversation and kind of see some of the things, you know, really what you're going to see with these KPIs is that they're in, integral throughout the revenue cycle process and, and really provide some needed metrics for overall evaluation. So now if we jump to that next slide, Amy, what is a KPI? So we'll start very basic. You know, a, a key performer performance indicator is a measure of a specific item or objective over time. It measures financial health, stability, and trajectory, and really gives value for further decision making. You know, when we think about what would characterize a good KPI, we, we use terms like actionable, directional, accurate, and measurable. So, you know, as we think about this without getting, you know, too, too elementary into it, you know, your KPIs really should meet all three criteria of those words within KPI. They should be key, meaning they're tied to something important that you consider is worth paying attention to. They should be performance related, meaning they help you understand how well some activity or activities are going within your, your organization. And they focus on something you at least have some influence over. And then finally, they should be an indicator, you know, something that you can measure that actually matters to you within your revenue cycle. You know, is this item or metric functioning good or bad? Is it improving? Is it regressing over time, et cetera? Yeah, you know, we'll get into some examples here shortly, but, you know, just f f f using that to kind of set the stage that KPIs begin to help you explain, you know, the health of an overall particular function within your, within your organization. So one other item that we, we see closely related to KPIs, but a little bit differently, you may hear you know, fairly similar, is OKR or objectives and key results. You know, in compar comparison to KPIs, OKRs are usually reevaluated more frequently and may change with your organization's overall objectives. You know, OKRs tend to be a little more ambitious, uh, a little more um, aspirational, possibly, or and, and a little more fluid over time. Quite honestly. You know, OKRs may be more directly associated with your organization's values or you know, the current vision or response to a change in your organization's attitudes. Um, but then getting back to KPIs in comparison, your, your KPIs are more top-down established criteria to measure ongoing performance, you know, month to month, year to year, time period over time period. Your KPIs tend to evaluate the functional items within your business and processes a little bit more than, than OKRs may. And, and generally speaking, you know, different hospitals, especially within revenue cycle, will likely have different OKRs based on their, their goals and their you know, aspirations, but they should have at least somewhat, some, somewhat similar KPIs, at least to an extent. So what is the purpose of your KPIs? Um, you know, first, it really helps in, in trending success of a process to show improvement or regression, like I just said before. You know, your KPI gives you a quick look to determine if you're you know, moving in the right direction, if you're showing improvement or not, you know, this month, the last month, year to year, et cetera. Did I get better in this area or did I regress? You know, second, your KPIs should help you establish a target for your team to strive for. Yeah, we will talk about this a little bit more in detail later on, but best practices around KPIs include establishing a target or a goal for each metric. So your team knows the standard they're trying to meet and exactly how close they are to that goal as time progresses. You know, so from building from that first idea, yes, we may have improved slightly from last month, but are we to that desired goal and target yet or are we still a long ways off? Uh, another purpose for your KPIs includes helping your leaders make informed decisions that are based on data and are more objective in nature as opposed to using that subjective. Um, you know, revenue cycle leaders face decisions on you know, either shifting your foot staff's focuses or, or what they're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, those KPIs can become critical in that decision-making process. They really can give credence and, and evidence for those decisions. And then finally here, KPIs can help recognize process breakdowns or opportunities for improvement. Um, you know, I think back to the change healthcare situation that was earlier in the year, you know, good KPIs in place around claim submission errors or claim acceptance rates may have been the first indication to your team that, you know, something had gone awry in, in that process. But even if you didn't have that in place, you didn't catch that, you know, your KPIs may be critical in uh, maybe quantifying how large of a problem that, that, that change healthcare may have been to your organization or, you know, how quickly it will take you to recover from that, that, that perspective.
So now we move into, you know, how do you develop KPIs if you have absolutely nothing in place? So we first start thinking about developing your KPIs. You know, the first piece is really spending some time developing and defining exactly what the metric is that you want to be monitoring and be sure you're detailing exactly how you intend to measure it. You know, you want to be sure that going forward, you obtain and measure the data the same way each period going forward. So the example that we have here um, is around denial count. If you come to the determination that, you know, we want to start tracking denials on a monthly basis, you know, you really need to define exactly what you mean by that. What piece of data are you pulling to, to get that number? Are you counting how many de denied line items occurred or how many invoices were denied or how many denial codes were posted? You know, each of these tells a very different story. And you just want to make sure from month to month you're pulling the data the same way so that the numbers don't tell you the wrong thing or they, they you know, vary wildly from month to month and you lead to improper decisions or, or conclusions. You know, a, a big part of this process is, again, to document how the data for that KPI is obtained. Is it pulled from a specific report or is it generated from a particular formula or a calculation? And really, you know, spend that time on the front end to document this process somewhere within your KPI reporting. You know, you want to define that KPI so well that someone else could come behind you and replicate that some, same number and metric themselves. Because, you know, honestly, it very well may be that case that someone else is doing that next month, next year, sometime in the future. And you want that consistency in how that number is pulled. And as we get to the last thing here, if you're starting from scratch, as you think about these, these first few KPIs that you want to put into place, maybe select one to three from each area within your revenue cycle. You know, start small, but try to encompass all areas of concern within revenue cycle. You know, so think back to that, that initial uh, slide that we had that, that showed that whole entire claim life cycle. You know, do you have KPIs that, that cover claim submission? Do you have some KPIs that, that, that cover some of your back end and denial management, insurance follow up? And really consider, you know, quite honestly, start from the basics. You know, what would be a value to measure in those areas? You know, you want to choose KPIs that align with organizational goals and give the best insight into your team's success. You know, track what matters and be detailed as you can to exactly define what success would look like in each of those areas. So again, we're, we're starting small. We're going to go grow from there. If you have no KPIs in place. How do you develop those first one to three KPIs for each area? You know, we'll walk through some examples um, around tracking denials here. But again, the idea is starting with something is better than nothing. And you can slowly build upon it until it, it meets your ultimate need. Um, what we show here is kind of four somewhat arbitrary levels described on the slide. You know, if you have nothing in place to KPIs around denials, we'll use that as an example again. Maybe your first step is to just start counting raw number of denials received each month. Again. As we, we said before, define exactly what you mean by quote unquote denials, and you count that number month to month until you have at least a slow you know, beginning of a trend that, that is emerging. And then you kind of build from that. Maybe at level two, you start to progress to a percentage so that you've, you've, um, you've taken that volume change and are minimizing your calculations. You know, maybe 7% of your claims are denied this month, but 9% last month. So, okay, great. We're moving in the right, not the right direction to get more data and get deeper into the weeds. Um, but even then, we can continue to build upon that and work towards, you know, what we have here is level three and four, where we see more actionable data and detailed trends to begin to emerge. You know, the number of prior off denials that we receive for a particular payer, you know, could be an indication of a number of things. You know, maybe that the policy has changed for a specific, um, you know, service, you know, you, maybe your prior authorization process has some holes in it, or maybe someone is, has gone on vacation. You know, those type of things will start to emerge once you have those KPIs in place to get down to that, that, that detailed um, level that you're looking at. Um, you may be able to go through these pretty rapidly. You know, it may not take several months, but even starting slowly is better than having nothing in place. Um, also, it may be that, you know, these level three and four are too much into the weeds for your high level leadership KPI team, your CFO, your CEO, et cetera, but these do provide a great amount of detail for your you know, front-end employees that are working your AR. So trending items like this really helps them to focus their areas on those top areas of concern and make actionable decisions based on the data. So as we think about the value of your KPIs, clean and consistent data helps for a number of reasons. Um, really, one, it helps to establish a starting point for communication for your team. It gives a metric or a point that you can refer back to when having conversations, um, really on decisions or any changes in behaviors that you may have. 
It also gives your managers an understanding of kind of the why behind the actions. You know, if you begin to see a drop in your cash collections, can you look back at a specific KPI and determine why? Is it because of an increase in denials or a decrease in the volume of claims going through the door? Or maybe you have more claim acknowledgement rejections and the payer's not even getting your getting your claims in that front door. So, you know, the first step to a solution is often to understanding the issue in full, and KPIs can help you do that. You know, similarly, you can use these KPIs to encourage team engagement or buying. You know, if you're making a decision to change someone's workflow or their scope of work or what their primary focus is, you know, it really helps to have those numbers in black and white to help them make an informed decision um, and understand what's going on. And then finally, you know, those KPIs can allow for course correction based on data. Again, going back to that example of, of change healthcare, as soon as you identify that, is there a, a behavior or a change that you can make to correct that, that KPI and move things back in that, in that process um, back in the right direction? So as we look at the next slide, you know, without consistent KPI data, small problems become bigger problems and can lead to costly situations. Yeah, you know, the first example I can think of here is your car dashboard. You know, when that check engine light comes on, you probably at least want to take a look before something massive goes wrong. You know, if the temperature gauge is creeping upwards, maybe it's as simple as just adding a little coolant. Um, you know, just do do the small little small little things before the engine overheats and blows. And you have a larger issue on your hands. You know, small things like a lack of team engagement or inconsistent data can really balloon into a larger issue if, if it's not recognized and addressed. So use those KPIs to identify issues before, again, they balloon into those greater problems. Yeah, you know, When we discuss KPIs in regards to in employee engagement, one of the things that comes to mind is you know, to help those frontline employees recognize the connection between their work and the bottom line. You know, as employee work flows in on a daily basis, you have team, team members com 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 completing their tasks but after a while, they, there's a tendency to kind of become a little detached from the bigger picture. And maybe they, they their day-to-day -day work just kind of gets lost in the weeds. They, they be kind of become numb to um, you know, the true importance and the impact of their daily work that's occurring. So I always like to point back to the, the impact that what they're doing has on a specific API, you know, an improvement from month to month that may have been the result of their efforts and really get that buy-in from them. You know, when, when employees can kind of connect those dots, they really see their efforts um, yeah, have a cont contribution to the success of the organization. And that's when those lights really go on and, and positive things start to happen. So we have here when, when effective KPIs are present, action happens. Um, I really would say when effective KPIs are embraced by the team, actions really happen. Um, so really think of these things here that we have listed as somewhat of a roadmap. When you have established and accepted KPIs in place, um, you know, everyone has the same version of truth the same roadmap to see you know, where you've been and where you're going. You know, successes and opportunities are easier to see for everyone. And there's factual data available to be used to engage other departments. You know, you, you, your KPIs are always a good way to make something that may be somewhat subjective into a more concrete black and white answer. You know, when everyone sees the numbers and they're accepted and embraced your KPIs, that they become a good justification for a lot of decisions. So following these roadmap items here, really helps you begin to create, you know, an environment, an environment built on data and analytics. Um, I'll say the fourth bullet here is pretty important though, is if you're going to build an environment that is data-driven and analytical, the focus has to be on addressing problems and not on nitpicking the data. So again, can everyone come to an agreement that the data that's being presented is factual, it's agreed upon, and there's no errors? You know, if there's errors in your reporting, or, or doubts around the accuracy of what is being presented as a number, you know, it really hamstrings the potential success of putting a KPI, you know, in, into place. And, but but once that agreement can be found, that's when you see those positive actions and greater efficiency and engagement occurring across the team. So now we'll just get into some examples of a KPI dashboard. Uh, what we have here is a, a pretty standard basic one generated within Excel. But what we do have within this is a couple of critical items. Um, number one, each KPI is listed in the first column. Normally, when I would create a file like this or a dashboard like this, each item would directly next to it have, you know, maybe it's in the comments of exactly how this data was pulled and who pulls it. You know, the billing manager pulls this out of this cash report from this report on this day or the two, two days after close, whatever that information is, but have that listed within the KPI somewhere. You know, you really want to document all those kind of questions that you kind of go back to the elementary school, you know, who, what, where, when, why, who pulls a report, when do they pull it, where do they get it from, 
you know, why are they pulling it? They're pulling it to fill up the KPIs, but all those other questions really go into, into you know, part of building that KPI. Um, hey, Ryan. The second, yes. It's Hillary. Sorry. Um, we have a question in the chat. Um, Heidi was wondering if you would be willing to share the KPI dashboard template. I, I think we can do that. Amy, we still have, we still have the, the, mm -hmm. um, the, the base one. We, yeah, that's not a problem. We can definitely do that. Yeah. We could definitely do that. And then the other thing that Ryan and I could do is work with you on, like, like as he's going to get into here shortly, is really talking about how to start with this. And so, you know, we can work with you too to help develop one that works for your facility. So um, as he's working through this, but definitely we can share this with you. That's great. And I, um, there's something else? I was going to say, and I see another question come in. So Hillary, I saw that question come in, come in as well, um, that we can share that dashboard with everyone and help you understand how it, it works with building that. No, awesome. I do see a raised hand still as well. I don't know if that's, that was the same question or if we have something else. I have a, I had a, just a comment in the, um, in the Q and A saying, thanks and love that you can share the dashboard. Oh, Great. Which is awesome. Yeah. Um, so again, like I said, the, the, the first piece of information we have here on this on the dashboard is again the metric, how it was pulled. I would say that the second major piece here is, is um each metric has a goal. So we know something we have a target that we're working towards. You know, that goal may change over time, but at least we know what we're aiming for. And everyone who um sees this KPI dashboard is aware of the goal and knows that that's kind of the 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 target that we're striving for. And then the third thing I'd say here that we have on this KPI dashboard is not really a requirement, more of a nice to have is that color indicator, that red, yellow, green as to how we are doing. You know, are we meeting that expectation? Are we close to it? Are we just way, way off? You know, th this kind of gives an idea of overall success. I would say though, like the last bullet though, you know, what is placed into this KPI dashboard should be agreed upon and used to help determine where focus is going to be put going forward. You know, it doesn't simplify your overall process but it does help to summarize and highlight those areas um, that could be potential you know, successor opportunities. Hey, Ryan and Amy, we have um, one person with her hand up. Would you like to hear the question? Yeah, yes. that's fine. Yeah, let's... yeah. Wendy, I, I, let, I gave you permission to talk so you can go ahead and unmute, Wendy. <laughs> oh, she... We, it looks like we answered that question. <laughs> <laughs> no, no worries. Um, so yeah, I, I think we can move on to the next slide then, Amy. I think we're, we're good from that one. Um, yeah, so reports to monitor RCMP indicators. You know, when we think about the reports we have in place, what we're talking about from a revenue cycle perspective is those that are involved in the clean life, life cycle. So these are the, the process measures that help to explain, uh, I'm sorry, on. Um, how the hospital or clinic AR process is performing. You know, these are separate, obviously, from your reporting measures in place for finance, your GL, your PL, things of that nature. But again, they do have a significant impact on, on those financial reports, especially from a bad debt perspective, things of that nature. Um, so you see that the two arrows are tied together. And although they're pointing in, in opposite directions, again, they do have a significant impact on each other. So as you consider, you know, what reports and KPIs to put into place, you know, keep in mind that. Keep in mind those that do correlate strongly to the general ledger or the P&L or your overall financial metrics and just how you consider choosing those KPIs that do have an impact on those, those financial reports. Um, what we have here is some reports to monitor revenue cycle financial health. These would be pre-claimed through front end. Um, so these are those, you know, you're trying to get that claim generated from, from a service being provided to onto a bill out the door and accepted by the payer. So again, just some examples here. We won't go through every single one of them, but we will show some of the calculations here shortly. But just to, to give you an example of some of those reports that uh, and metrics that may be of value from a KPI perspective on that front end. And then on the next slide, Amy, we also have you know reports to mon monitor uh, financial health that are tied to transaction processing and AR management. So these are more AR related maybe back in denial management, but you know, days in AR, accounts receivable that have aged over 90, 90 days, you know, things of that nature that kind of give you a more holistic approach and a view of you know, how is that AR being handled on the back end and being managed by your team. Um, from a calculations perspective, 
these are more from your re for reference once this presentation is distributed. But just to be aware of how to calculate some of these items, we do have the, those formulas there. And to be sure that when discussing internally with your team, you know, everyone is on the same page as to what metric you're discussing. You know, even within some of these that have pretty standard calculations, there are some variations available. Um, days and AR, for example, often folks use 90 days rolling, uh, a rolling 90 day time frame. but some calculations, some folks use 60 days, 120, 180. So just be aware of that, you know, decide what that, that metric will be and kind of stick to that as you move forward. Um, from a HFMA map key initiative, HFMA has created this initiative to assist in key performance indicators around revenue cycle. So there's map keys in five major category groups, including uh, patient access, pre-billing, claims, account resolution, and financial management. Um, MAP uh, terminology is a three-letter acronym for uh, measure, apply, and perform. And we've provided the, the link here for more information around that standard and those benchmarks that they have listed through HFMA. Um, there are some opportunities within that MAP initiative for peer comparison, some benchmarking, and other items as well. So just be aware that that, that is available, um, an option there through HFMA. And with that, I will hand it back over to Amy <laughs> to discuss some of the KPI best practices um, that we have in place. Ryan, we did have one uh, question pop up right at the end there. Sure. Um, Diane was wondering, do you use gross or AR days and why? So I've seen both. I mean, I, I think Matt, taking gross uh, gross days in AR, net days in AR, I think both are a value. Some of it depends on you know how you're um, defining your contractuals when you're taking them. You have some systems, as soon as you bill, it's being taken on that front end, some are on the back end. Um, I, I would kind of track both of them and see what the discrepancy is and how the variation occurs. And really, some of it comes down to how that financial um, you know, contractual is being taken within the system and when those are occurring. Yeah, they're very similar to one another, but it it just um, it depends on really how your system is. Yeah. All right. Yeah, and, and you can you can you can play some games with those numbers if you want. You know, some systems, <laughs> some folks don't want to count. You know, they they count you know business days, and some folks count calendar days. So you know, to say you know, I, we I, I'm almost you know contradicting myself, you know, there are some of those benchmarking numbers out there that says, you know, you know, 45 days, days in AR is great, or 50 days in AR. It's like, okay, well, how are you calculating that? What are you really mm -hmm. defining by that? And, you know, you, you can drop your days in AR from 80 to 50 real quickly if you just change the calculation. So yeah, um, I'll have to say, well, <laughs> um, I, I would look at both and just kind of see how those vary from, from month to month and decide based on your system what makes the most sense. So I think that really leads into some KPI best practices, Ryan, because, you know, you really want to make sure it isn't here, but or it might be on a future slide, but you really want to make sure that you stay consistent about it. It's like you it is possible. Or it's sort of hard to say, but, uh, you know, full transparency when you've been in the when you've been in revenue cycle for a while, you know, sort of how to move some of those metrics. And so you want to make sure that you're staying consistent with it so that your KPIs are, you know, genuine and really valid. And so you want to make sure that you hold revenue cycle meetings, you know, your team meetings to review the results. So that, as Ryan shared, you are building that environment of best practices in monitoring that and monitoring for results. You want to make sure that you're tracking, you know, that you track and monitor your KPIs that are actionable. I mean, if you have something that's like, oh, we need to reduce it by 30 days, well, that might not be an actionable item, but reducing your KPI, you know, reducing your days outstanding by five days is a more relative thing. In benchmarking against industry standards and internally to trend over time, we did show you um, two different items that were out there on that sample benchmark that we, that sample KPI report that we put together. That report is actually built off of what we see in the rural healthcare market. We gave you what HFMA says because they're looking at it from an industry wide. It will have both metropolitan as well as smaller areas, but then they do have map keys out there that they track they can show you like here's the highest performer in a in a critical access hospital here's the highest performer in a system and things like that so you have those different industry standards to go against but then also to say 
it, you know, as we were talking about things that are relative to your your organization, if you were impacted by change healthcare and you're having trouble, you know, getting your claims out the door, well, then that industry standard may not be the best standard to look at. It may be a goal that you're shooting for, but you've got to get caught up in that backlog that was there. Or if you've transitioned to a new system, that may also cause some challenges there. But to know that here's where we're going internally, where our trend is, but then also, you know, what does that look like? And then developing an environment that's data-driven and open to improvements that, um, you know, I hear there are certain things that's out there. Like if you think about the airline industry, how, why is it that the number of airline crashes has decreased over the years? And there were studies that were said that they changed the environment of being one of um, accused, you know, of, um, they changed the environment to where people were willing and open to share things that could improve the process. And by having that improvement in their system, in that environment of giving those improvements and sharing that with one another, and then that improved to just the overall success rate that they had. So, you know, what are you doing within your organization to develop that environment? Some yeah, other things. Amy- Oh, go ahead. I, I, was, I was gonna jump in there. Like you make a good point. You, know, you think back to that the 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 KPI dashboard that we showed, you know, I think the initial reaction when you put that red, yellow, green indicator into place and oh, we've got a red, you know, th- this metric is red, and people immediately get on the defensive. But if, again, if you get to that point where okay, we're data driven, you know, being red does not mean someone is not working hard. It doesn't mean that, you know, mm-hmm. that they didn't do their job or what was told to them. Maybe the process is broken, maybe change healthcare is broken, maybe something else is <laughs> Impacting that, but just to be again, if you get to that data driven and you know that open and honest you know approach to it, and say okay, yes, it's red. What are we going to do as a team to organize or an organization to improve that and get that back to the yellow or the green? And it could be too. You need to change the standard for your facility. I mean, we've given you what the benchmark is, but if the benchmark is to get your AR at to forty five days and you're sitting at seventy five. That's not a valid, that's not a valid benchmark to go to. If you're at 75, yes, that's where you need to be heading. But maybe you need to, you know, set an environment and a data, data-driven environment to where you really want to get to 50 days first, you know, and what do we need to do to get there? Because if you're looking at red and you've been looking at red for the past, you know, four years, well, something might be wrong in the metric. You just really need to make sure that your environment is set up for that success. And then, and then I know Ryan mentioned it, but this is key, and especially in some of the systems that you all are operating in, to really establish who, when, and how the data is obtained. You know, employee X pulls metric Y from res- report Z at time B. You know, it's having all of that documented out. Who's pulling that report? When do they pull it? Do they pull it in the morning? Do they pull it in the afternoon? What report are they doing? Because sometimes the criteria on that report can definitely change the results that you get. And then make sure that there is a reporting cadence around it. Is it daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly, yearly? Because what, you know, you need to stick to that because there are some reports that cannot be reproduced. One of those is like unapplied cash. Well, it's unapplied cash right now, but the minute the poster posted, it, it's no longer unapplied. It's hard to go back and recreate what that was. So really just determine that cadence and stick to it, understand who's pulling it so that when they're not there, you're able to gather that information. And then looking at the information, it's so funny. I heard somebody speaking just over the weekend about how they don't enjoy, you know, they don't enjoy Excel. They don't know it. I live and breathe in that world every day. And I look at it and go, you know what? Your KPIs can really help you spot trends and anomalies. But to realize that you need to look at it in different ways. What is that way that you, you know, how are you looking at it? Are you looking at it with the current period versus the prior period, like this month versus last month? How are you doing and what do those numbers tell you? Because you can see in here, all of a sudden I'd look at it and go, I've got a problem in my cash collections because it's gone down 15%, right? But if you go back and actually look at the report compared to the prior year, you can see that in cash collections, it's actually up 
5% over last year. When you look at July of 2021 versus 22, okay, maybe that was a few years ago, but you understand what I'm sharing that, you know, it's when you look at the current period versus the prior year, you can see that there were some changes that occurred and, you, and what happened within that to impact it. And then the final one would be the current period versus the prior year end. And so you could see that this facility, their year end ended on December 31st. And when you compare that cash collections, you can see that we're actually up. And so with this facility, what happened was they put an initiative into place to where they would improve the front end cash collections. And improving that front end cash collections, they did make a change year over year. And you can see where it changed as of January 1st. But the reason it dropped off since June June of June versus July is because most of the patients had reached their maximum deductible. And so therefore the cash is still coming in, just not at the heavy level it was at the prior months of the period. Another thing to look at it is to just look at the difference, ask questions. Who, what, when, where, why, and how? And as they say in Six Sigma, you know, ask why three times. You know, why did this, why did this, why did our cash go down? Well, the why went down, you know, because people had met, you know, because we didn't collect as much as last month. Well, why did we not collect as much as last month? Well, people hit their deductibles. Well, why did they hit their deductibles? Because they've incurred expenses throughout the year. And sometimes by asking why three times, you really get to that true, in, to that true answer. You want to look at the information differently. You know, are there aging buckets you see that are increasing or decreasing? Is there a specific payer that stands out? You know, why did that happen? Is this an annual trend for that payer? Do you, you know, some of you may be operating in states where, you know, the state budget ends as of September 31st. And so between August and September, you're not getting your payments in as much because those payments are being held. But come October 1st, boop, the money is going to come in the door. And you just know that that's a trend that happens. Another thing to do when spotting these trends and anomalies for those that don't like Excel, you know, don't just focus on the financial areas. Maybe you need to look at the entire process. Has there been an operational change? One of the things that I saw in one facility is that they had a staff turnover. And when that staff turned over, you know, that person who left was responsible for getting prior authorizations. But once they left, the new person that came along, they didn't understand the Im implication of not getting that prior authorization. And so when you look at the denials, the denials about two months into the process started increasing. And it's like, oh, we had an operational change and the person who did it no longer is there. And then for those of you who are in revenue cycle, you probably understand this more than ever, is that the first answer isn't the only answer that's out there. You know, you could have had a prior authorization problem, but then, you know, in the beginning of this year when Change Healthcare went down and they handled prior authorizations, that impacted it as well. So multiple factors are at play, which means there can be multiple answers. So don't just give up when you get to those um, get to those multiple answers and think, mm, I'm done. Maybe there is another area out there that's causing issues with it. And then also, would you have vendor involvement with your KPI success? You know, if your revenue cycle is outsourced to a third party vendor, you know, don't just think mm, KPIs don't relate to me. KPIs will help you be successful in managing that relationship with your vendor, as well as understanding how that relationship works and making it a more successful relationship. Because what you want to do is make sure that your vendor is meeting the expected service levels, you know, timelines for deliverables. What does that look like? Focusing on actionable data where you're analyzing leakage points, because it could be that gaps in the performance and corrective action plans, they need some information from you in order to get the information, or it could be they're not paying attention to how the specific need is for your critical access hospital. 
You want to make sure that you have vendor accountability and oversight so that you clarify that expectation and the appropriate cadence of communication. When's the last time you talked to your revenue cycle vendor? Was it yesterday or was it last year? You know, what does that look like? And then the points of contact, what it needs, what type of information do they need from you and what needs it? you know, escalation to a higher level, or what's the appropriate response time from both the vendor and your hospital on all of the items that are there. Some of them, like prior authorization, might need an immediate response. Other items like, hey, how do we want to handle this write-off policy? That may take, you know, not need an immediate response, but maybe be responded to within the day. And then when thinking about payer contracting, that's another area to think about with your KPIs. When you have discussions with your payers, you can go back to them and say, we've been tracking our denials. Here's the total dollar value that's been billed and here are the number of claims that we submitted and here's the, here are the number of denials that have come back. Providing that information to your payer when you think we don't really have a leg up, you know, we don't have a leg to stand on with these payers because we're so small and they're so big. By looking at your KPIs and the information that you're tracking, you can go back to them and say, we have data on your performance and your performance is lacking. Therefore, you need to, you know, Cut, you know, you need to be better at your performance in medical necessity and prior authorization and just what the financial health of the contract is. Because if you go back to them and say, we've got data on you, that data will give you the leverage that you're looking for to have those to have those conversations. And then the, the next area related to it is to develop a daily rate. You know, Ryan's mentioned it, I've mentioned it about change healthcare and your clearinghouse. You know, how do you know you have a problem? What does that look like? Looking at your daily rate, you take it over a period of time and say, here's how many days have been in it, how many claims that were submitted, claims accepted, claims rejected. What does that look like? Were you impacted? Were you not? And what and how can you improve that? Or does that align with the volume of business that's coming into your facility? Do you have the, you know, is there a problem in your process or is it working through? And then to how does that cash collections? Do you have a daily rate established for your cash collections and that process? So that would just be different ways to utilize your KPIs, looking at it on a daily basis, on a monthly basis, having discussions with your, uh, your vendor who's doing your revenue cycle or a portion of it, as well as to your payers that are out there. Those discussions and, and really using this data for your information. And so with that, um, I will say we're up to our Q&A portion. Here's the information on Ryan and I. So what we're going to do, I'm sorry, I totally skipped ahead. Feel free to either send your questions through the chat box or through the Q&A. Hillary will get those and send them back to us. Or if you want to just reach out to us directly, you can scan that little QR code that's right there. It will give you, uh, bring you to our contact information and you can load it in your phone, send us an email and we'll be happy to chat with you. I will tell you with both Ryan and I, our families really appreciate it when you reach out to us and talk to us about Revenue Cycle because that means they don't have to talk to us about it. So <laughs> my husband's always very appreciative when you do that. With that, Hillary, do we have any questions that are out there? Um, we we do have a couple. We had one um, from the Q&A that we were going to go back to, okay. um, which was um, Diane's about, do you help create a cash waterfall so that you can project cash receipts? Yes, that is one. It, uh, that cash waterfall, we can help you work on creating that. Um, it's not one of our top like five that we focus on that's sort of like number six or seven but we'd be more than happy to partner with you on how the best strategy for creating that and what that looks like and down to the level of details so we'd be more than happy to work with you on that all right and um let's see we do have a couple more questions um here we go how do i know 
if I have the right KPIs in place or if I'm missing something critical. We always seem to find things that are falling through the cracks. Ryan, do you yeah. want to take that? Yeah, I, I would, for one, go back to um, the, the examples and that listing that we had, we provided in here of the, the calculations. Those are some of the standard, I'd say, KPIs to start with. But then I, I guess I would take a more, I don't say holistic, but a, a, gener a general perspective in it. You know, if you think about how do I know my, I have a daughter who's in high school. How do I know my student in high school is doing well? Well, I, okay, I'm going to look at their GPA, their ACT scores, their attendance, et cetera. And I, and I take just kind of that philosophy, okay, what are the, the three to five things in each area that would let you know you're you're doing well? How would I know if I'm doing well in claim submission? Okay. How many of my claims are being submitted every day? How fast do I work those denials when they don't get accepted? Things of that nature. And really just walk back through the process, going back to that larger claim life cycle and defining what success would mean to you in each of those areas. And do you have a KPI that measures that? And if not, how can you develop one based on the system you have in your process in place? Mm -hmm. Thanks, Ryan. Thank you, Ryan. Um, all right, another question we have is, says we outsource most of our revenue cycle. How do KPIs differ in this situation than when revenue cycle is done in-house? Yeah, I, I think Amy's last slide or the, one of those who really hits a nail on the head, but I would say that, you know, the the initial thing, thought when you outsource some of your revenue cycle or a piece of it is, okay, great, that's off my plate. That's someone else's problem. Unfortunately, <laughs> not, not, nothing against the vendors, but they will slide if you don't keep your thumb in their back. So it, it is critical to one, look at those agreements that you have with them. What, what did they agree to do for you? And what was that service level that they and that expectation that you had in place when they signed that agreement? Are they living up to it? And how do you know that they're doing a good job? Um, and I would say, don't take their numbers at face value, but really spend some time to dig into them. Um, I think once they realize that, hey, this client, this hospital, this whomever is not going to let me do substandard work, subpar work, and you're on their, you're on top of them for the first three to six months, they'll realize, you know what, let's just do, let's just go all the way that extra mile and give them that data before they even ask for it. And it'll make the, your life a whole lot easier working with those, those vendors. And I would also say, Ryan, that there are some things that the vendor can't do. The vendor yeah. can't, or, you know, you can have them go and talk to your clinician to get increased medical records and documentation for it, for say, if you have coding outsourced, but they can't make the data up. They've still got yeah. to come back to you. They still need your front end registration team, the person who's working with the patient with that, that front facing contact to um, capture the right information. And if they don't, if so even though you've outsourced it, there's still a responsibility that you have to do on your site. So you can't just say out of sight, out of mind, I don't need to worry about it, but still need to have that open communication with them and together understand where you're headed as opposed to just letting them do their own thing and trust that what they say is great. And yeah. also Ryan, and Ryan does say it to me all the time. He's like, Amy, you know, the squeaky wheel gets the oil. And that is the case, you know, when they, and especially if you are within a system, you know, you may be part of a system and your claim volumes were in the, your outpatient claims are say $500. Well, are they going to focus on your $500 claim? Or are they going to focus on the $500,000 claim that's at a sister hospital. And you just really want to make sure that they understand that to you, that $500 claim is as important as that $500,000 claim is. And I will say, just putting in a plug, if you ever need somebody to help them bridge that gap, happy to, happy to have that conversation as well, because I'm real passionate about, you know, that small dollar to you is so critical that whatever we can do to help support you in having that conversation sometimes to help them get it, happy to, happy to partner with you on that. Awesome. Any, other, Thanks, Amy. any other questions, Hillary? I am not seeing any other questions. All right. Well, with that, then I think we are up to um, handing it over to Keith. Keith, are you still there? Yes, I am. All Good right. Good afternoon, everybody. 
looking forward to it. So handing it to you and enjoy Thank you the much. conversation. Thank you. I, for one, enjoy listening to you talk about um, Revenue Cycle, you and Ryan. So I will say that. But I'm going to talk about something a little bit different. Um, um, my name is Keith Bubble. I'm a senior data analyst here at Stroudwater. I've been with uh, with the firm for, for over 20 years now. Um, um, and my job is um, kind of behind the scenes looking at data um, that helps our, our clients um, see what's going on in their markets. And as Amy said, uh, you know, we were in rural markets um, and uh, we have um, we have partners with and, and sponsorships with, uh, you know, rural advocacy groups um, um, that help us kind of, you know, uh, to figure out what's looking at the rural market and see what's going on out there. Um, so what we've done um, in this past couple of months um, is uh, partnered with uh, 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 the uh, NRHA and uh, and NOSOR uh, to put together a public dashboard of, of data for um, for advocacy for rural. Um, so I want to kind of go over that dashboard, um, show you where it is, um, how you can use it, um, kind of the background of how we uh, how we came to this project. Um, what data sources we used, and um, um, and so maybe some suggestions for how you might be able to use it. Um, again, it is a free public resource. Um, it's something that we plan on on keeping uh, keeping going on our website and and updating it periodically. Um, and so let's get into that. I'm just going to share my screen here. Okay, so the background. Um, Again, as I said, it's a state and congressional district profiles, uh, partnership with NRHA and NOSOR. Um, and the background of this is it was inspired by a, 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 a CA conference where um, you might, everybody might know Alan Morgan started, talked about the, the power of, of, of lobbying uh, at the grassroots um, for, for rural health. Um, so the team at Stroudwater, we started discussing like, what can we do to, to, to kind of help, you know, policymakers and board members and, and, and people like yourselves um, and other partners with rural to, to arm them with rural health facts that are specific to uh, uh, to what's going on in, in in the rural parts of our country, and um, so they can and, and we wanted to do it by congressional district because um, you know as advocacy to have that information at a congressional district is very powerful to go to your uh, uh, your representatives on on, on Capitol Hill and. Um, and, and let them know what's going on in your in their backyards. Um, so this uh, so uh, NRHA and. No, sir, both saw a lot of value in developing this 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 dashboard, these these profiles. Um, so they decided, you know, that it would it would be uh, it would give you some some critical baseline information uh, on what's going on as far as healthcare access and 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 health outcomes, uh, workforce, uh, the infrastructure um, in rural communities around the country. Um, and again, breaking down that data by congressional districts would help the, the NRHA and others to uh, to advocate with members of Congress. Um, and um, the data would help uh, the NR NRHA and members and, and members of no sort um, uh, to t better tell the story of, of rural health, which is which is an important story to tell. Um, so we actually presented this, um, worked on this over um, last December, early in this year, um, and we presented it at the uh, the NRHA policy conference in Washington D.C. Um, and then actually, what happened as as after we presented it, we 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 made it live and. Um, uh, participants at the conference went off to uh, to go visit visit their members of Congress um, and their representatives, um, and um, they were able to to use some of this data uh, to show their their uh, their reps and uh, uh, the the people that worked in the office what was going on in their district. So it could be very very powerful. One thing I want to say is like please, um, as I'm going through this, feel free to uh, ask questions um, and. Um, as a background, this is a the first version of this, so we are hoping to get a lot of feedback from users like yourself um, to let us know how we can how we can improve it. What data um, should we add? Um, you know, does it work for you? So so keep that in the back of your mind as we're going through that. Okay, so our goal, um, so we based the the profiles on the three uh, focus pillars that NRHA was was interested in. The one was work infrastructure, so um, the places where people get healthcare. Um, uh, you know, the actual buildings, the hospitals, RHCs, the clinics, uh, skilled nurse facilities, et cetera. Um, second pillar was the workforce. So who are the providers um, in that in the in that congressional district and 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 where are they located? Um, and we we've got a breakout of different providers that I'll show you here that we're looking at. And the third one was equity. So obviously equity has been a very big push. Um, the and social determinants of health, and we realized how much. Uh, of a factor that those are in in terms of outcomes and 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 health access, 
So um, that is included in here. Um, and um, in addition, we thought that outcomes would be a, a good thing to show um, uh, in as, as well as equity uh, to kind of show how those how those two things are related. So the, so there's some health outcomes in here as well. So like I said, this is the first version. Um, uh, it's it's live now, and I'm going to share the uh, the link with you if you haven't already seen it. Um, and and please, our, our object, objective is to get some feedback um, either today or um, I will show you. There's a contact form on the bottom of the of the the website. Uh, that you that will go directly to me. Uh, so I look forward to hearing from, from you. Okay, so the data sources that we were using, that we used, um, two things we wanted to, we publicly available data, very important, um, because we wanted it to be recognizable, so easily understood by, by a broad uh, audience, um, and, and then also accessible. So all of the data that I'm going to show you here is data that you can get, uh, you can download yourself if you wanted to, but we thought it would be a good idea to kind of download that, put it all into one big, one central location, uh, that people could use. Um, so again, it's 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 out there and 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 recognizable. So the primary data sources we used for infrastructure, again the buildings, uh, we used um, uh, HRSA. HRSA has a facilities list. Um, again, with the clinics, hospitals, uh, critical access and PPS hospitals, and skilled nursing facilities. Uh, we tied those clinic uh, the 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 provider numbers to um, uh, cost report volumes uh, from the from the hospital cost report information system that is uh, freely available. Um, we download that here at Stroudwater and keep it keep it updated. Um, so we've got going back several years. Um, so uh, the volumes we got from there are hospital beds, discharges, bed bed days labor and delivery, nursery days, uh, visits, and and sniff days, et cetera. So uh, again, so because it's publicly available data, there's some things we couldn't quite get, such as like ED visits, you know, because there's not really a good source of all that, um, so, or births. So uh, what we want, we used, for example, of, you know, labor and delivery days and nursery days is kind of a, a, a measure of the volume of what's going on at these 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 facilities. Um, for workforce, the, those, those providers of healthcare in the community, uh, we use the MPI file. Uh, the downloadable file, which is which is freely available, it has every every physician who reports to Medicare who has an MPI number is there, um, and it's it's updated uh, every quarter. Um, for uh, the outcomes and the equity and the social determinants, um, uh, two sources we use mainly. The CDC has uh, a, a website called Places. It's got some really really good small area estimates of 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 outcome and outcomes and equity data. Uh, which is just really, really fantastic because it's a it's a great resource to show. It's nationwide, and you can get really kind of granular. We're using the county level here, uh, but you could actually go down to the zip code level if you wanted to, and we've done that in some, some other some other applications of this data. Um, and then uh, Robert Wynn Johnson, everybody uh, I think is familiar with county health rankings. Great, de great resource as well. Um, and then we use a census so for some population data and uh, the crosswalks for the congressional districts. Um, so as I went into, apparently there's a lot of different definitions of rural out there, which I didn't know that, which surprisingly. But uh, so we wanted to keep this consistent. So um, we used uh, HRSA again as our as our resource. So in the infrastructure file, when you download that facilities data, um, you have the physical address of the, of the facility and it's right there and it says whether it's rural or not. Um, the workforce, we're using a zip code level. So it's the zip code of where the provider has their office. Um, and uh, HERS uh, uh, provided us with a, uh, a list of uh, uh, zip codes that are rural or non-rural based on their methodology. So we just tie that into, into there. Um, and then for the uh, the county level data for uh, uh, outcomes and equity, this is uh, using HERS's rural uh, county methodology. Um, so it's based on a census tract. So if, if uh, 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 we take all the census tracts that are in the county, uh, what population or what percentage of them are just defined as rural from HRSA, and then it's just a percentage of that of that county. So, for example, I'm, I'm in Cumberland County, Maine, um, and we're about 36% rural because we've got a larger city in Portland, but we also have a lot of outlying census tracts that are that are that are rural. So, and we'll see a little bit of that in in, in a bit. Um, and then we just assigned each of those pillars to the to the districts using some uh, crosswalks that we got from the census. Um, some initial feedback we received. Um, uh, it's it, uh, it's been good. So uh, you know, students developing legislative district uh, charts for the de districts um, um, that um, from the Pennsylvania Out Office of Rural Health um, grant writing. Um, it's, uh, uh, it's handy for, for for grant writing because it shows kind of a you know easy to, to see overview um, specific data to to your state. If you wanted to look at a uh, you know if you're a rural health coordinator. Um, 
and uh, you know, kind of kind of a nice nice feedback so far. Uh, but again, and we've gotten some suggestions too, which is great. So, um, all right. So, how can, uh, for example, a state office or a critical access hospital use this dashboard? So, state offices, you know, in addition to the advocacy, you can uh, um, you can utilize it for several things. Uh, again, it's a baseline data to establish the state of rural in your area. Uh, as we go through the dashboard, I'll show you, you're going to get like an entire state view, and then you can zoom in on those, on those congressional districts. Um, it's a central resource for, for, for information. So again, as I said, this information is publicly available out there. Uh, we wanted to kind of bring it all together so it's accessible and in one spot where everybody can get at it. Um, uh, and again, you can use it as a, you know, developing your narratives for, for grant writing um, or, you um, the needs section for a flex application. We're actually personally in uh, Stroudwater, we're using it um, for uh, critical uh, um, uh, community health needs assessments uh, that we are doing with, with clients because um, it's valuable data there. Um, and also on the other on medical staff development plan data, are we using a lot of the, the social determinants and the outcomes data and also the uh, the MPI file with the, the provider um, volumes, not volumes, but the provider um, uh, complement. Uh, to in, help inform our medical staff development plans. So there's a lot of use for the data. All right, so I'm going to do a, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a quick run through of uh, what the dashboard looks like, um, and then just kind of how it works, and then I'll, I'm going to jump into kind of a live demonstration, um, and we'll look at some some specific uh, to Region D uh, areas. So when you go to our website, um, uh, the page, uh, this is what it looks like. Uh, you'll get uh, kind of an overview. Of what I just talked about, um, what allows you to do, uh, kind of the the information that's on there, uh, and then right in the middle of the page, as we start to the dashboard, kind of looks like this. All right, so here's our infrastructure page. Um, uh, the way that it works is on the up. Uh, this is showing Alabama because it's comes first. Um, up in the upper left hand corner, you've got your uh, your map that shows your congressional districts. Um, this is a uh, selector map. Um, so as you click on that, you'll you'll be able to um, to filter the rest of the of the of the images on here. If anybody's familiar with Tableau, this is what we're using Tableau. So you, it's it's uh, uh, it's a great it's a great tool for this this type of thing. So um, this has um, uh, so on the bottom here uh, is shows the actual location of those facilities. Um, so all of the on um, those categories here to the right in the table, uh, critical access and PPS hospitals, um, the FQHCs. The RHCs and the skilled nursing facilities, um, and then we have um, uh, the, the the breakout of the uh, the volume types. Um, so, um, and then using those those rural versus non rural categories that we assigned to them earlier on, we can show you know what are the what percentage of the volumes of, of these different types of, of volumes or, or, or visits um, are happening within a rural setting, uh, uh, you know, a rural zip code or a rural at a rural facility. Uh, so in Alabama, you've got overall. 44% of those uh, of all of those things we're showing here are happening in rural areas. Um, and then it breaks out differently, you know, as far as, you know, beds and discharges, you've got your swing beds that are mostly rural. Um, and, and then of course your uh, uh, RHCs are going to be mostly rural by definition. So um, um, the uh, color codes obviously show that, uh, you know, the, the, the darker orange are things that are happening in, in a rural area. And um, uh, the blue is the, uh, is the non-rural. So as we go through here, um, you can select a congressional district. Uh, and right now we're looking at Alabama, Congressional District 2 shows you up on top. Um, everything zooms in, so you get some detail from all of those things. And uh, when we get into the dashboard in a minute, I'll show you kind of how you can mouse over uh, and get some additional information. Um, on the right-hand side, uh, I should have said this before, but there's a drop-down that allows you to pick your state, whichever state you're in. Um, we've got all 50 there. Um, and then, yeah, so it filters uh, the the data as uh, uh, what's in that that congressional district. The workforce tab uh, is a very similar layout. Um, uh, this, again, we're looking at Alabama Congressional District Two. Um, same basic idea here, um, except we've got um, the the number of providers uh, for these different classifications. Um, so the classifications. Uh, this is based on the taxonomies that are in the M the MPI file. Um, and we've kind of grouped them together into, uh, um, uh, you know, some, some more provider groups, basically, to make it a little bit easier to see. So, so family medicine, et cetera, um, oral health is going to include dentists and dental hygienists and oral 
uh, surgeons and things like that. So I'd be happy to share the, the breakout if anybody has any questions about those. Um, uh, um, so these are the providers that we're looking at currently, behavioral health, oral health, as I said, um, family and general practice, um, nurse practitioners, OBGYNs, et cetera, um, and uh, behavioral health too. So behavioral health is going to include psycho psychotherapists and psychiatrists and uh, family counselors and things like that. Um, so all coming from the MPI data. Um, and, again, and similarly, as you click on your uh, your congressional district, you'll get a, a breakout of uh, where these providers are located. Um, and then um, that's on the top. The bottom chart uh, with the bar chart um, shows actually the number of the, the count of those uh, of those those individual providers. So, you know, so in this case, um, nurse practitioners are the highest count of uh, this of these this group uh, workforce in the congressional district uh, two uh, for um, uh, Alabama, um, and then a, a, a breakout showing the which the percentage are rural. So the tables are there. So we kind of show the data in all different kinds of uh, different kinds of ways. All right. The next slide is the uh, the health outcomes. Um, so, as you uh, get to the the, the the slide here, you're going to start with a uh, kind of an overview of the state. Um, um, uh, this is showing all of Alabama. Um, the outcome, the different me measures that we've we've used from both the CDC and from Robert Robert Wood Johnson um, include tooth loss, um, cancer, um, heart disease, uh, depression. This in, in particular here, we're looking at a, an example for, for diabetes, uh, overdose deaths, um, uh, blood pressure, infant mortality, life expectancy was an interesting one, um, and obesity and suicide. So we kind of try to cover like the, uh, the major uh, things of dental health, mental health, um, infant uh, infant health, and um, uh, and other just kind of you know chronic disease categories. So there are additional measures that are out there. If you think that maybe some others might be might be pertinent, um, I'd be happy to add those uh, as well. Um, uh, like I said, the CDC does a really good job of of kind of pulling all this data together um, uh, and and making it available for people to use. So um, so the 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 map color here, um, you can see it says on the top the variance from the state benchmark. So what we did here is calculated the uh, one calculation that uh, what I actually did here was uh, calculating the uh, uh, the state benchmark because the CDC only does a county and uh, uh, national, but um, not not individual states. So but using the same methodology, methodology it was easy to kind of back into the um, calculate the, the overall state um, uh, because they give the numbers and the percentages uh, for the population. So um, in this case, what it's showing is that for the measure of diabetes, 12% um, of uh of the population uh over 18 years um in alabama has has uh diabetes um and then the the you know the colors will show whether the uh the the, the individual county um is higher or lower than that state benchmark and then that'll change as you as you as you pick the different measures um over on the bottom there you've got the uh bottom left uh the county and then the actual measure and then the variance and then and then that percent rural uh, which I'll show you in a little bit is uh, is kind of that using that that HERSA definition of how rural is this county, and then uh, the equity and the uh, social determinants of health uh, tab is very similar to the prior one uh, with the same kind of uh, calculation showing the state benchmark. Um, the available measures that we're looking at currently are um, you know aging population, so those are populations over over sixty five, um, the percent of population, education, which I think is a bachelor's degree. Um, excuse me, minority status. Um, what the CDC did here was take uh, census data um, and look at um, uh, racial and ethnic populations uh, and grouped uh, grouped categories and grouped them together and said what you know what percentage of that is a, is a uh, um, the the percentage of the total population is a, is considered a minority status according to the according to the Census Bureau. So. Um, Single parents, um, unemployment, which is kind of a rolling average of unemployment, not not a, not a current one, but uh, kind of an over or, uh, overview. Um, and then what we're looking at here is uh, the poverty level. So showing that uh, you know in Alabama you've got a twenty five point three percent overall uh, percent of people living below that poverty level level of one hundred fifty percent, and then where are the pockets of uh, either higher or lower within the state? Um, that is. Uh, that's or that. Um, I'll show you uh, when we get into the benchmark, uh, the dashboard here. You can download these images uh, as we talked about. Um, you know, uh, using them for your own reports. 
um, for your own advocacy, and I'll show you how to do that, and then also how we can uh, you can look at what uh, counties that are, are that are uh, more rural. So I'm going to first before we go into the live demo, I want to just say again our our goal is to continuously improve this. This is just version 1.0. Um, it is a free resource. It's going to be available on our website, um, and I'm going to uh, post the thing in the chat right now. Uh, please, if you have recommendations on how we think we can improve this, um, you know, take it for a spin. Let us know. Um, uh, and there's a form right on the website. Um, and again, we're looking for for feedback here. Uh, it, accessibility: Does it make sense? Your experience using it? How useful is it? Information? And again, you know, what what metrics could be added that might be helpful um, to tell the story of rural health where you are. Um, hey, so Keith. If I can do yes, Hillary. Um, so we have a one question. Um, sure. David was wondering where can we access the information being shown for the states? For the states. Uh, well, uh, I just I just shared the dashboard um, um, link in the chat. So if anybody wants to open that up, I can, can do that. But I'm going to go over to um, the. Uh, let me just share the actual. Uh, Hold on a second, please. Okay. Here's the dashboard. Um, David, I'm not sure if that answered your question or not. Uh, the, 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 uh, this is the actual dashboard here, um, shared in the chat again, as I showed you, you know, it's, uh, um, oh, by the way, if you haven't signed up for the fourth annual virtual conferences, you can register <laughs> right there on top. Um, uh, again, it gives the overview of basically what I just talked about. So a little more information about uh, the, the background here, um, uh, uh, what's included here. Um, and then here's the dashboard. Let me just, before I get into that, data sources are, are down below. If anybody's interested in looking those up, uh, the HRSA methodology shows you here. Uh, you can uh, link to that and see how we use that. And then there's some information about the NRHA and, and NOSOR and things like that. Uh, once I get into the dashboard here, let me just show you, uh, this is the feedback. Uh, this goes directly to me, uh, Keith. So, um, you know, please feel free to use that, um, as a, as a, uh, for, for comments or suggestions. Okay. So since we're looking at region D and I hope I answered that question, David, um, let's just reload here. I'm going to click over to Arkansas. It's the first one. And let me just, um, I'm gonna go full screen here. Okay, so in Arkansas, you've got your um, uh, four congressional districts. If you don't happen to know where your district is, if it's a larger state, sometimes there's a lot of them, especially like places like Texas and California. Um, there's a little highlighter here. If you mouse over it, you'll be able to, to find out where it is. Um, and it'll show you where, where it lies in, within the state. Um, so let's look at, for example, um, District 3 here. Actually, let's go over. Let's get something more rural. There we go. Um, so, uh, congressional district one, um, uh, you know, 80% of those, those, uh, uh, those volumes that we talked about are, are, are in a rural facility, uh, consider rural, um, uh, and then some of the features, uh, the interactive features with, with Tableau is as you mouse over these, uh, these points on the map, uh, you'll get the information about, uh, you know, what, what is actually there and some, uh, some, some more detail of the provider type, um, what category, um, you know, where they're located and, and their, their rural status. Uh, so a um, couple of other things that you're able to do here um, with um, with Tableau is if you're looking at this and you want to say, okay, well, I want to just look at, say, the uh, RHCs, um, each of these will allow you to kind of, uh, kind of filter uh, or highlight, um, or if you want to look at hospitals and RHCs, um, uh, so you'll get some, some, some information there. Um, I'm just going to back out of this real quick, and then this is where we can actually download these um, uh, the, either the image uh, to allow you to just kind of get a nice PNG image that you can drop into your PowerPoint. You can also also download it as a PowerPoint as well, uh, um, and it's, um, it's it's pretty clean. So um, that's the, uh, the infrastructure piece for Arkansas. Let's jump over to workforce. Um, again, you kind of start with your your overall uh, state view. I'm going to go into a full screen again, just a little bit easier. Let's look at number one again. Um, and then here are the breakouts for those um, 
uh, you know, those, those provider types uh, that we talked about. So, well, you know, again, overall, high number of north, uh, nurse practitioners and behavioral health specialists um, and, um, and, and, you know, so the, the, the rural versus, uh, versus non-rural locations of those offices. Now let's look at the, uh, the health outcomes. So overall, uh, you know, the, the measures here are the drop down here is uh, um, allow you to look at things, you know, what starts with, uh, the, with tooth loss um, um, and how, um, how the CDC and how Robert Wood Johnson does it. So it'll, it'll, it'll it say what the, the actual measure is here. So this is looking at, you know, tooth loss among uh, adults over 65 um, and down on the bottom here, uh, uh, you'll get the uh, the source if you have a question about what the source is, where that data is coming from. Um, let's look at some of the other things. So I'm just going to look at, say, you know, coronary heart disease. Uh, what are the the kind of how the those variances are within the state of Arkansas? Um, again, if we wanted to look at a individual congressional district, we'll pick up pick number one here, um, and it kind of gives you a nice uh, you know nice overview of where the kind of the strengths and weaknesses are within that district, um, you know, trouble areas, problem areas that you might want to focus on. So um, that's heart disease. Uh, life expectancy is an interesting one. This is from the Robert Wood Johnson uh, uh, from County Health Rankings. Uh, so, uh, you know, overall, the state benchmark for uh, the for Arkansas is about 75 and a half. Um, and uh, um, you can see highs and lows within those within those regions. Um, the, the, um, uh, rural and urban counties, uh, remember we talked about the, the percentage of rural. So this will allow you to kind of just, you want to say, all right, just show me the counties that are hundred percent rural within, uh, within Arkansas. Um, and it'll filter those down. Um, so you can see kind of a breakout there. And likewise, let's just look at the urban so for for HRSA, the calculation is uh, that um, what 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 we use is anything uh, over fifty percent uh, rural, but under one hundred percent is mostly rural. Again, one hundred percent is going to be rural, um, and then it's the the reverse. So between zero and um, you know more than zero and less than fifty is going to be mostly urban, and then there are some counties that have zero uh, um, uh, census tracts that are that are considered rural so they'll, they'll be uh, they'll be completely urban so that's the out outcomes and i'm going to jump over to the uh, equity uh, and social determinants of health there we go okay so um the measures available again we have um uh, aging population so the percent of population over 65 um uh, we've got uh, uh, education, uh, minority status, poverty, single parents, and uh, uh, unemployment. So let's just look at poverty, for example. It's an overview. Um, so, um, again, this is the CDC measures. So state benchmark for people uh, below the 150% of the poverty level in, in Arkansas is going to be 27.3. Um, and then you can see that there are some, some you know, pockets on the eastern eastern half of the state here that are, that are much higher. So... Um, Again, looking at different congressional districts, will uh, you know change that 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 uh, the map view, give you some more information. Oh, I did also want to say that you know as you mouse over, if you're familiar with Tableau, as you mouse over the different counties, you know, you'll get more detail um, of of what's actually being shown in there. So, I'm going to step back out of that for now. Uh, once again, I want to emphasize that we are. Um, you know, looking for feedback on this. Like I said, it's one, uh, just version one, and um, uh, it's only been released um, uh, in in February. Uh, so we're trying to highlight it, and hopefully, it'll be a good resource, good free resource for uh, for our our partners in critical access hospitals uh, around the country. Uh, you know, and people in rural health uh, can use to to kind of not only see what's going on in your own backyard, but to to share that story with others um, who are who can make a difference. So um, with that, I'm actually uh, going to open it up for questions now. Um, if anybody has any questions or 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 comments or feedback, hey, I do you have one question? Yeah, go oh, ahead. Go oh, ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. 
Uh, one question we had was, uh, this is from a, a prior uh, session we did. So what, uh, what will be added next? Um, and uh, what we're planning on doing is uh, um, uh, uh, two things initially. One is uh, people ask for to show nurse uh, nurses, so registered nurses, LPNs, um, as a category uh, in the uh, in the workforce. Um, so we're adding that. That's going to come out in the end of this month. Um, and then, and additionally, um, NRHA in particular was very interested in looking at broadband coverage, uh, specifically for telehealth coverage. Uh, so. Um, uh, one of those social determinants of health categories for the CDC is broadband internet subscriptions. Uh, so we're going to include that as well. So it'll show where the kind of the, uh, you know, weak spots are for that, for that uh, very critical for, you know, for telehealth purposes in, 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 in rural areas. So those are two things that are coming up. Oh, thank you, David. Um, I, I appreciate that. Yeah. Are you seeing the, um, oh yeah, and Diane, um, that's a good question. Um, yeah, we the we we try to get data that is you know publicly available. If it's if it's not there, it's just it's just not it's not reported. So the source is for that is um, is Robert Wood Johnson. So um, there are there are gaps in the data um, in in some cases that you'll see. Uh, for the most part, everything is everything is covered, but uh, in, in those specific you know cases, they are uh, uh, gaps. Yeah, same with same with uh, with with suicides. So, um, so if there are you know additional data that comes out, we will you know, we will look and we might change them. And if there's a better data source that kind of covers that more um, uh, in more detail, we'll certainly add those. Great questions. Yep. Um, and then the other one of the other questions I had is how often uh, are we going to update it? So the the, the different sources will, um, uh, you know, they have different different timelines of release. Like I said, the MPI data is released quarterly, I think, um, if not sooner. Um, I, I expect the CDC will do theirs every year. We're using the 2023 release uh, for this this case. Um, so um, our, our plan is to kind of probably use the same uh, rollout, um, unless we're doing an update, like I said, with, um, you know, with uh, looking at nurses or with... Um, uh, uh, the uh, broadband. Um, we'll probably just do run it, roll it out at the beginning of, the, of each year um, as the data is available. So, and you know, we hope to present this again at uh, at the policy conference in in DC next year and kind of use it as a um, get get some more more uh, uh, more advocacy going from it. So, Keith, I think we had also gotten the question uh, yesterday about whether this this. Um data and service was free and whether it would be uh, useful possibly in grant writing. Yes, this, this, what you see on the website is free. There's no login. Uh, it's uh, again, it's all public, public data. Um, we just wanted to make it as ac accessible as a resource. Um, if you have specific, uh, we did get a request from a couple of uh, users already who want to look at you know, multiple regions, um, uh, or or look at uh, zip code level data, which is available. Um, you know, or or just real de detail. I mean, we have I have the data, um, you know, loaded and ready to go. So it can be, I can be you know I'm happy to work with anyone who uh, who has any uh, you know specific needs that might help. Like like we said, you know we you know we're using this for for critical uh, community health needs assessments um that we've been doing with with clients and and also uh for medical staff development plans so um it's the same same data but just a you know slightly different look but it's uh we have it available kind of at our fingertips so and that, that the idea was to just you know have everything sort of in a you know central place where people can use it so um yeah so any any like i said feel free to reach out to that uh using that uh uh that contact form at the bottom thank you keith um, sure. Are there any more, any final questions before we um, close for today? Um, I'm not seeing any. Um, so with that, thank you, Keith, very much. Mm -hmm. um, and thank you, Ryan and Amy, um, for these presentations today. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. And um, we will see you back here again for the second part of our Region D conference tomorrow, tomorrow afternoon. Before you, excuse me, uh, before you go, um, thanks. Yeah, thanks again. And uh, when you log out, you'll get a, uh, a, a moment to fair, uh, 
survey to share some feedback. We'd love to hear um, your opinions. Um, so please, please take that survey when it uh, when you log out. Thanks, everyone. Take care.